great to be here. My name is Hagai. I'm a, an engineering manager with Amazon AI, working on deep learning systems. Um, I'm super excited to be here today. Uh, I came all the way from California uh, to Paris. Um, and you know, our mission with Amazon AI is to put deep learning in the hands of millions of developers and putting an AI in the hands of millions of developers. So it's exciting to be here today, listen to all these great talks, and also speak to you myself. Today I'm going to talk to you about um, model serving for deep learning, which uh, was mentioned actually in a few of the talks before. We think it's a very interesting problem because uh, deep learning is now hitting the production uh, ground uh, in so many companies, and you need serving infrastructure to be able to do that efficiently and at scale. Okay, so let's get to it. I actually want to start by talking about why deep learning is a big deal. It's very hyped in the media, but there's a lot of truth behind it, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, in fact, if you only look within Amazon and uh, yeah, to see the breadth of how deep learning is being adopted, it's quite amazing. Uh, if you look at Amazon.com or Amazon.fr in your case, uh, personalization uh, is moving significantly to use deep learning. Uh, Amazon Music that I used to work on is also using uh, deep learning for things like station creation and recommendations. Uh, you look at the backend logistics, uh, optimal route planning is moving to use deep learning. These uh, nice robots you see there actually powering up Amazon fulfillment centers, and they're using more and more deep learning. If you look at the voice revolution uh, with personal assistance, which uh, Alexa uh, pioneered, uh, many of the tasks done by Alexa are actually handled by um, deep learning. And lastly, autonomous vehicles. Um, Amazon has uh, delivery drones, which you might have heard of. Many difficult tasks that these drones do is actually handled by deep learning. There's another reason why deep learning is uh, very interesting and is a big deal, and that's how well it does. Um, I want to talk to you just uh, briefly about that. Um, ImageNet competition was mentioned earlier on in one of the talks, and uh, ImageNet competition is a competition that happens every year uh, in which software algorithms try to solve the image classification problem. That's a pretty simple problem to define, pretty hard to solve. Given a, an input image, identify the most prominent object on that image from a pre-configured or preset classes of, uh, of uh, objects. Um, and of course, deep learning runs on cats, so this example is using a cat. And uh, as you may know, in 2012, uh, Alex, AlexNet won that competition. It was the first, uh, or the first uh, winner of that competition that was based on deep learning. Um, and since 2012, the winner of this competition year after year was a model based on deep learning. But what's more interesting um, is actually how deep learning is doing compared to humans, not only other machine learning algorithms. This is a graph taken from a research study published in 2017 that actually measured the performance of state-of-the-art image classification models, all of them based on deep learning, compared to humans. And as you can see in this graph, these models, which, by the way, none of them today is state-of-the-art, is outperforming humans significantly. So another reason deep learning is a big deal is because it's actually doing more and more tasks better than humans. OK, hopefully now you're convinced. And the next thing you want to do is you want to take your awesome deep learning model and deploy it to production. Um, what does this look like? So the high-level schema is pretty simple, and not very different than deploying web applications. Um, on one end, you have your trained model, which you want to use. On the other end, you have a bunch of clients. It can be mobile, IoT, other cloud services, whatever. And then you want a system in the middle that is scalable, so you can scale it out as your load increases, that encapsulates your model somehow, and that exposes a network endpoint interface over the, over the internet, for example, to allow these clients to make calls to invoke predictions and get the results. This involves quite a few important aspects, which is what we call the undifferentiated heavy lifting of uh, model serving. And I want to go over some of these key uh, aspects or concerns such a system needs to, needs to handle. First of all, performance. Uh, deep, learning, uh, deep learning's computational load is really immense. If you look at a modern uh, vision model like Resident 152, it has hundreds of layers. Uh, and just one single forward pass inference to that network requires billions of floating port operations. Now imagine you have a scalable service that handles hundreds or thousands of requests per second. Imagine the computational load of such a service. So 
such a server framework for serving models has to be efficient, has to utilize the hardware well, has to be able to scale out and do other good stuff. Other aspects are uh, availability. Um, we want to make sure the system is always available, even when nodes fail, or even when you deploy a new version of your model. Networking is important. You want that system to expose network interfaces that are widely used and adopted, handle things like security and other stuff for you. Monitoring, if you ever owned a production a service, you know that at any given time, you want to be able to go into that service and identify exactly how well it's doing, what is the load on the server, what's the utilization on your different nodes, and all that stuff. And in the case of deep learning, you want to be able to look into different aspects of the deep learning system itself running inference. Decoupling your model from the server is another important aspect. You want a server infrastructure to be able to run models regardless of whether they're identifying cats in images or synthesizing speech whether it's convolutional networks or recurring neural networks or just multi-layer perceptrons, it should just, just work seamlessly. Cross-framework. As we all know, there is many neural uh, deep learning frameworks out there. There is MXNet, there is TensorFlow, there is PyTorch, and there is more. An ideal server framework will just handle models created by any of these uh, frameworks in a seamless way. And similarly, there are also quite a few uh, platforms for running deep learning. There is Intel CPUs. There's NVIDIA's GPUs, and there are other uh, companies who offer these uh, performance uh, platforms. We want the server to encapsulate that complexity and just run optimally uh, on all of these. So that's what we call the anti differentiate heavy lifting. And I want to talk to you a bit about how Model Server for MXNet, which is a project uh, we open sourced late last year, uh, is handling some of these aspects. Um, I'll give you a few, just a bit of background on MXNet. Uh, it's an Apache open source project. It's a framework for building neural network and training them and deploying them. It was created by the academia, CMU and University of Washington. And AWS adopted it as the neural network framework of choice in late 2016. There is a nice blog post by Vogels, AWS CTO, explaining uh, why AWS did that. And the, one of the main reasons is that it's immensely scalable. Some of the highlights, easy to use. It has APIs across different languages beyond Python, including Scala, uh, including even Perl, C++, uh, and R. Um, it has both a dynamic um, imperative API and a symbolic API. It's hugely performant, uh, and it's optimized for GPUs, CPUs, and even ARM architectures. And it's portable. Um, one use case we see a lot is people training their models with MXNet in the cloud and deploying it to edge devices. We have a serving framework that I'm, I'll be talking a bit about more. And uh, it also has Onyx support, so you can use your models built with other frameworks and, and use them in MXNet. I want to give you a quick uh, demo um, to show you a bit of how this is used. So installing model server is pretty easy. You just do a pip install MXNet model server. And PyPy takes care of installing all of your dependencies and model server itself locally. Um, it's a matter of under a minute to get that. And then that's it. You have model server installed locally. Uh, let's just check out what we've installed. So we do a pip show command, pip show MXNet model server. And we can see the details, like the version, the GitHub link. It's all open source, by the way. You can see everything and other uh, details out there. <clears throat> this is a bit of an outdated version that this demo shows. The latest version is 0 0.4. We released it last week. Um, model server has a, a CLI, command line interface. If you do a model server dash H, you can actually see uh, all of the parameters. And there's really quite a few. I won't go into details. Uh, there is uh, configuring the port to listen to, attaching to the host, GPU activation, logging configuration, and there's other things. But the key things I want to uh, show you here in the demo is the dash dash models, which is really the key one. It allows you to specify key value pairs of the models you want to host and serve. The key is something, just a string you define for the model, and the value is a URL or a local file system path of your model. Now let's, let's uh, actually go ahead and uh, serve a model. Uh, to do that, we'll go to the GitHub repository um, of the model server. Um, AWS lab slash MXNet model server. Uh, we tried to do a good job of documenting 
uh, model server. So there's a bunch of documentation and uh, readme files and markdown you can see. Uh, what we also have under the docs folder is a model zoo. So getting started is really easy. This model zoo contains really a bunch of models across different domains um, that you can just grab and serve and use them in your system or use them as a demo or do transfer learning with them. Um, in this demo, we'll look at SqueezeNet. SqueezeNet is an image classification model that was uh, built for mobile devices, so it's very thin. I think it's around five megs in size. Um, and our model zoo has all the details about the reference paper, um, how to start model server, etc. But let's just do it quickly ourselves. So we'll copy the URL to the model. I'll talk a bit more later about what is this model file. But it's everything your server needs to serve that model. And serving is very easy. Model server dash dash models, squeeze net equals, and then the URL. That's it. You don't need to download anything yourself. Model server now downloads that model file, unpacks it, loads it into memory, binds it, and sets up the endpoint to serve that model. All done automatically for you. So now model server is running on localhost port 8080, which is the default. And let's just make sure it's alive. We'll do a curl command, hitting on a slash ping endpoint that it exposes. And we can see we got the JSON back. Apparently, it's healthy. Cool. Uh, now let's uh, go ahead and grab, grab an image, because our model does image classification. Let's grab an image we can run classification on. And in the tradition of deep learning, guess what image we'll pick? It's a cat image, yeah. So let's uh, do a curl-o to download that image. And let's make sure it's indeed a cat image. It is. OK, great. And next, let's do a curl command to actually ask our model server to run prediction on that model. So again, we'll use curl. Uh, model server expects a post command uh, for predictions. So you do a curl dash x post, HTTP, localhost, port 8080, which is the default. The endpoints is slash squeeze net, which is our model name we defined, and slash predict. And then we just provide that JPEG binary file as an attachment to that uh, request. And hit enter. And we can see our model did the prediction. 85% probability this is an Egyptian cat, which I guess the model is right. Um, yeah. So that was model server in action. Um, I want to, there's much more details, of course, but I want to talk a bit about some of the uh, key, uh, some key aspects on model server. The first one is the model archive. That's the slash model file we've seen before. That's how we actually encapsulate models and we decouple models from the server. So model archive contains everything model server needs to serve that model. Of course, first of all, a trained network uh, with the parameters, the trained parameters, and the architecture itself. It contains a signature, which is just a JSON file defining models for model server what is the expected inputs and expected outputs for that model. That's how model server knows how to set up your endpoints for you. You can also, if you want, include custom code, which can include custom pre-processing and post-processing operations. You can even override inference itself and use scikit-learn if you want to, instead of MXNet or any other framework of your choice. And you can pack into it any other auxiliary, code f uh, auxiliary files you may want that your custom code may want to access. Use the CLI of the model server to export it into one file we call the model archive, which contains everything in there, including uh, manifest and some other things model server will need later on. So that's the model archive. Another aspect is containerization. So I showed you guys how to use model server in the demo, but this is really for prototyping testing purposes. If you want to deploy model server for production at scale, you should not use what I showed. You should use our containers for that. Containers, as you know, are lightweight virtualization, um, provide isolation. They run anywhere, and you have great orchestration frameworks to use. You have Amazon ECS, you have Docker, you have Kubernetes, um, and you, can, you should use that for orchestrating your fleet. We provide an MMS uh, Docker image that is pre-configured and optimized for you, and I'll talk a bit about what this means. You just do a Docker run or whatever uh, your uh, container tool of choice, and you can set up container clusters. In this case, I'm showing an example where it's uh, running on ECS, but you can use anyone, any other tool. The container comes with, 
with uh, Nginx as a scalable reverse proxy. It comes with a mechanism that does pre-fork uh, for multiple processes. Actually, we fork automatically the number of processes to match the number of vCPUs. If you have multiple GPUs, it will automatically use all these GPUs. And there are other optimizations that are pre-built into that image that you can, of course, control by yourself. But that's our recommendation for production serving at scale. And lastly, operational metrics. <clears throat> I mentioned earlier why this is so important for anyone running a production service, including for deep learning. And we built that in into model server. Um, so model server gives you really lots of metrics from requests, errors, latencies of different parts of the execution pipeline, resource utilization. It reports it on both a per model basis and per node basis. And you can configure it to send these uh, metrics either to your log system, logging uh, file, dump it into a CSV, or it can also be automatically reported into AWS CloudWatch. And which this is a nice example of a nice dashboard on AWS CloudWatch, uh, where you can see your different metrics. You can set up alarms and you can do all that stuff. Um, <clears throat> lastly, I want to talk about some of the things ahead for model server. We're still working very hard on performance. Uh, that's a key thing, reducing latencies, in increasing throughput. We're doing interesting stuff around adaptive batching there and optimizing our HTTP stack. Um, we keep on working on extending the platform support, and there's a lot of interesting work we do there about Onyx and about other hardware runtimes. And of course, adoption. Uh, many teams inside of Amazon are adopting uh, model server, and uh, we're seeing also uh, users outside of Amazon also adopting it. It's all open source. You can free to fork it, check out the code, file issues, requests, and uh, we will help you use the model server um, to solve your business problems. Um, so I think that's it for my talk. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned about model serving, some of the challenges uh, uh, involved with that. Uh, both MXNet and MXNet model server are open source. Uh, I want to encourage you to try it out and uh, let us know what you think. Thank you.